Hello and welcome to my talk about the paper Practical Exact Proofs from Lattices, New Techniques to Exploit Fully Splitting Rings. Um, I'm Gregor Seiler and this is joint work with Khan Nguyen and Mohamed Eskin. Okay, so our paper is about a lattice-based knowledge proof system. Um, so let me quickly uh, revisit uh, the structure of uh, general um, proof systems. Um, yeah, usually there are two tasks that one need to solve. So first, there needs to be a commitment scheme that allows to commit to some secret vector S, and then uh, one has to have means to prove what we call linear and product relations um, between the coefficients of this vector. So on this slide, there are two equations. Uh, the first equation is uh, a linear uh, relation because it is linear in the secret coefficients S1 and S2. And then there's a product relation, uh, which is called a product relation because it involves the product of two secret coefficients. So in this case, it's a simple square of S1. Um, now in this paper, the goal is uh, basically to, to focus on the first part and construct a more practical linear proof for a particular lattice-based commitment scheme, namely the BDLOP commitment scheme. Um, and then this can be combined with um, the product proof or efficient product proof that also exists to, to construct a full-fledged proof system. And as soon as one has such a proof system, then in principle, this allows to prove that uh, the vector S is a pre-image of some arbitrary circuit, which is a very powerful tool. Um, I say in principle because uh, when the vector S becomes long and the circuit large, then the performance uh, depends on, or the performance of the proof system depends on how the proof system scales uh, with these parameters. So for example, the length of S. And unfortunately, uh, we don't yet know how to construct a sublinear proof system based on uh, uh, lattice hardness assumptions. So sublinear means that, uh, for example, the proof size uh, scales uh, sublinearly in the length of S. Um, but this is not the end of the world, and uh, yeah, not, not the end of the world at all, because there is actually an interesting regime of, of smaller statements where the scaling is not really uh, uh, important because uh, the, the performance of the proof system is, is completely determined by, by constants. And this is where, or for this re uh, regime, this is where this line of research is, is, is aiming at. Okay, so one of the reasons uh, for the linear scaling of our proof system is that we use uh, this BDLOP commitment scheme. And, uh, and yeah, this is, or the, yeah, the linear scaling comes from the fact that uh, the BDLOP commitment scheme scales linearly in the length of the message. Um, so since you need to output the commitment, uh, the, the proofs also are linear. Um, the reason why we still use uh, BDLOP over other, other commitment schemes, so they're, they're uh, would be other commitment schemes uh, that scale sublinearly, or other lattice based commitment schemes that scale sublinearly. And so the reason why we still use BDLOP is um, that it has some very nice, powerful homomorphic properties. For example, like this linear property on the, on the slide. Uh, and uh, secondly, um, um, on top of the, the linear proof uh, that we construct in this paper, there are already very efficient opening and product proofs for this commitment scheme. So by an opening proof, I mean just uh, the, the basic building proof of the building block of being able to prove that one knows an opening to a commitment, which is kind of used internally in, in both product and, and linear proofs. Um, yeah, so this is the reason for BDLOP. Um, to better explain what this uh, linear equation on the or this homomorphic property on the previous slide means, I need to um, introduce the, the algebra that we're using. And as is usually the case in lattice cryptography, uh, we work over a cyclotomic polynomial ring and more precisely um, over the polynomial ring, which is uh, consisting of polynomials over ZQ modulo the power of two cyclotomic x to the 128 plus one. And then 
this uh, nice ring has some very nice uh, property uh, that uh, we call the NTT basis. And what this means is that depending on, on, on this prime Q, the Chinese remi reminder theorem says uh, that uh, our ring RQ can actually be identified with the vector space ZQ to the 128. Um, and yeah, this, this uh, identification or this isomorphism um, is a map which goes from RQ to, to this vector space and we call this isomorphism the entity isomorphism and uh, we write uh, the image of some polynomial f uh, as f hat. So essentially f hat is the entity vector associated to the polynomial f. And the reason why we, we call this the entity is because uh, computationally uh, there's, if you really want to compute uh, this map, what you have to do in an implementation of, of, of many schemes, then you do this usually via what is called the number theoretic transform, and uh, this number theoretic transform really essentially just computes uh, this, isom this Chinese reminder isomorphism. But we still call the map the entity map. Okay, so now uh, in the beginning I said we need to be able to commit to, to vectors. Um, but the BDLOP commitment scheme is usually defined as a commitment scheme that uh, takes polynomials in RQ as messages. So um, we need to say how we go from there to vectors and maybe the, the, the stra straightforward approach would be to just use the um, coefficient vectors of a polynomial um, as, as, as the vector representation of some polynomial and commit to to basically a vector by taking the polynomial which has um, uh, the basically the coefficients as in the vector, but we do something differently because we use the entity basis from the previous slide. And what this means uh, concretely is that we define a new commitment scheme which I now call COM prime, uh, and uh, COM prime takes some uh, vector as message. So let's write this vector as s hat and we, as basically the entity of some polynomial S, and then uh, commit to it by just computing, uh, computing the commitment of the polynomial S. And yeah, this new commitment scheme, of course, inherits some homomorphic property from, from, from COM. Um, and uh, more precisely, it also has some, some linear homomorphic property where uh, the, the linear combination now involves pointwise product. And the reason for this is uh, that uh, before, uh, in the linear relation, we had uh, polynomials products, but they translate to pointwise products under the entity. So what this means is we can manipulate uh, uh, vector commitments in the following way. If we are given uh, two commitments to, to S1 and S2, and I now always drop the hat if I, if I uh, pronounce some vector, just for simplicity, then we can multiply these commitments by to other uh, vectors a1 and a2 in some way that I'm not going to go into now, and then we get a new commitment uh, to the linear combination with um, pointwise product of, of s1 and s2. And yeah, the reason why these pointwise products are very useful for the knowledge proofs is that for the product proofs, uh, pointwise products is really what, what we need. Because uh, if you think about a standard product proof, then what one has to do there is to uh, multiply one secret coefficient with another secret coefficient, and this is very close to what, what a pointwise product achieves. And in contrast, uh, a polynomial product uh, kind of mixes up all the coefficients, so this is not really useful for product proofs. Yeah, so, what, so much for the commitment scheme. I'm now um, explaining in some detail, but still at a high level, how our linear proof for the commitment scheme works. And this will basically proceed in a couple of uh, steps. And the first step uh, is based on the pretty standard observation that if um, the vector S multiplied by some matrix A, and then this vector um, multiplied uh, uh, in an inner product fashion or with a scalar product uh, with some uniformly random challenge uh, vector phi, then um, the, the scalar product, if, or if the scalar product is zero, 
this actually shows that a times s is zero with the sum is error one over q. And the reason is very simple because if a s were not zero, then the scalar product would, would be completely uniformly random and hence zero only with probability one over q. Now, in a second step, we can rewrite uh, the scalar product. Um, and we do this by pulling over the, the, the matrix A to the other side. So now we write um, the scalar product as a scalar product of a secret vector with uh, the, the product of the transpose of A times times phi. And the reason why we do this is uh, because both this matrix A, which defines uh, the linear equation that we're interested in, and uh, the challenge uh, vector phi, they are public, so it makes sense to, to essentially um, group together the public things on one side of, of the scalar product and the secret things on the other side. Um, so with this new scalar product, which I now again just write as um, a scalar product of S with some vector phi, so I essentially drop the, the, the A um, because it's not really important anymore uh, after all. Um, yeah, it just clutters notation. So the, the phi from now on is basically what the AT phi was before. If I've given such a scalar product, then, um, and if I think about what, what uh, the scalar product really uh, does, then I see that I can decompose this into two parts. So first I can take a point-wise product, a pr product of, of these two vectors, S and phi. And then in the second step, I need to sum up over all the products, or basically over all the coefficients of this point wise product, so the, the coefficient products. Um, this is what is given in the first equation on the slide, and then in the second slide um, I have used the homomorphic property of the NTT map, which means that the point wise product of uh, uh, the vectors S and phi can be written, so, so remember that these vectors S and phi are actually the NTT, of, of uh, uh, two polynomials, and now I can write this as the entity of the polynomial product of the two polynomials. And the reason why this is interesting is because um, if we define the polynomial f to be uh, the, the product of these two polynomials before, then by a simple property of the entity, um, the constant coefficient of this polynomial is, at least up to scaling, just uh, the sum over the entity coefficient. So what this means is that the constant coefficient f0 by um, a property of the NTT map is the sum over the NTT coefficients. So this is the uh, sum over the coefficients uh, fi hat in this equation. And then uh, because of how this polynomial f was constructed, this is now the sum over the pointwise products of the two vectors s and phi that we're interested in, which as we saw before is the scalar product. We we want to compute. So what all of this means is that if the verifier is somehow able to compute a commitment to f out of uh, the commitment to s that he is given as part of the proof, then um, we only need to somehow come up with an efficient uh, proof that the constant coefficient of, of this method polynomial f is zero in order to prove uh, that the scalar product is zero. And this is what I'm now explaining how this works. Um, so here the problem is that the BDLOP commitment scheme doesn't make it completely straightforward to prove single coefficients. So what one can prove is, for example, that a full a polynomial is zero, but in our case uh, it's not um, uh, safe, or it's, it wouldn't be zero knowledge to reveal the full polynomial f, so we need to somehow mask all the other coefficients except, of, except the, the, the constant coefficient. And the way we achieve this is basically um, using the following observation. So as before, if uh, our linear equation or, or a linear uh, term AS is, is non-zero, then the constant coefficient is uniformly random depending on the challenge. So if now the, the prover sends some polynomial H, which is the sum of F and some masking polynomial G, where we need to make sure that g is independent of phi, then as soon as h has a constant coefficient, this actually shows uh, the linear equation a is equal to zero, again with s on as error 1 over q. And the reason for this, again, is very simple, because um, 
yeah, as I said, if a is, is non-zero, then the constant coefficient of f is uniformly random. And uh, I said that uh, I basically demand that g is independent uh, of f and hence independent of, of the challenge. So um, the, 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 the constant coefficient of h stays um, uniformly random, just depending on the challenge phi. So if this is zero, then, then f must have constant coefficient zero, one over q. In practice, um, this is then performed in, in, in the following way to make the uh, proof actually correct. So the, the prover will choose a masking vector where all the coefficients are uniformly random except the constant coefficient, which is zero. So in this way, uh, the polynomial h will always have uh, zero constant coefficient in the honest execution, um, which the verifier can check. And if um, the relation that he claims to prove is not true, then he cannot cheat because um, we force him to make uh, the, the polynomial g independent of, of f and phi by um, forcing him to commit to g before he sees the challenge phi. This is how this proof of the scalar product works and with this I'm finished uh, with the technical overview or the, the high level overview of our, over our main technique. There now remains one central problem and this is that so far we have only managed to prove uh, the linear relation with a probability or with a soundness 1 over q, which is not negligible because in lattice cryptography we usually have very small q. So for example, think about uh, the NIST uh, finalists or the lattice-based NIST finalist, uh, uh, the, the encryption scheme Kaiba, which has a q which is about 3000, and then there's signature schemes, uh, there's uh, Falcon, which has a q which is about 12000, and Secondly, there's a second uh, large space signature scheme. There's uh, a dilithium, which is maybe closest to, to our protocols, but this uh, scheme still only has a Q in the order of 2 to the 23. So one over such a small Q is, is certainly not negligible. And we have um, to, to give a way to, to, to boost this probability, or this, uh, yeah, the sounds. Um, yeah, maybe as a side note, uh, you, you could just say, okay, why not just instantiate everything with a larger uh, Q, like uh, in the order of 2 to the 1 in 28. And there are pr two problems with this approach. So first, uh, our proof system wouldn't be as efficient as we wanted, well, we'd like it to be. And uh, secondly, um, this also has problems with the security. So uh, such large Qs are certainly much less studied than the Qs we use in actually uh, well-studied schemes like, like the NIST schemes, and uh, um, also there seem to be recent results that point in this direction that large queues are not as secure as, as, as we are maybe hoping. So as a takeaway, we have to live with pretty small queues and boost the sounds. And in the paper, there are two approaches for this, which we call um, basically mapping down or going up. So the first approach is the mapping down approach, the second one is the going up approach, and in the talk I'm just focusing on the first. Um, this works in the following way. So um, in principle we now want to prove uh, several uh, scalar products. So what this means is that we are given several polynomials fi and we want to prove that all uh, these polynomials have vanishing constant coefficient and then by this we prove that um, several scalar products with a different independent challenges um, are zero. Yeah, so a, a straightforward approach uh, would be to just repeat the previous protocols uh, several times for each fi, but uh, th there would be costs involved uh, for this approach, like for example sending several uh, mask vectors h and committing to uh, the, the, the different masking uh, uh, polynomials g, and uh, these constant costs and this increase in constant costs is precisely what we want to involve, uh, basically avoid in order to construct really efficient um, practical proof systems. So uh, in the paper we give a better approach and this works as follows. Um, uh, the first observation is that uh, there is a suffering in our ring RQ which we call SQ and now in this example I let SQ be the cyclotomic of degree 64. And concretely, um, as a subring, this cyclotomic consists of all the polynomials 
where only every fourth coefficient is non-zero. So uh, the, the constant coefficient is non-zero, and then the next three coefficients uh, the, uh, are zero, and then again the, the, the fifth coefficient is, is non-zero, and so on. Um, and on top of this property, there is a nice map which goes from the large ring RQ to the small subring SQ, which is called the trace map. And this trace map can be written as the sum over um, certain automorphisms, or more precisely over the, the powers of some automorphism sigma. Yeah, and not, not just this. Um, the map also has the, the, the very important property for us that it essentially leaves the constant uh, coefficient invariant. Uh, so uh, the constant coefficient is only again scaled by some factor, but since we want to prove that it's zero, we don't uh, care about such a scale. What, so why is this interesting for us? And the reason is that we can now use this map to construct the following polynomial f, which is just a linear combination of all the images of the fi under the trace map um, with factors that just shift the polynomials by multiplying with them by, by uh, some simple power of, of, of x. And if you look at this expression and uh, basically the properties of, of the trace map that I've uh, given before, then we see that f is now a polynomial where the first uh, four coefficients are the, the uh, the four scalar products we are interested in, um, and by proving that uh, all these four coefficients are zero, we prove that four scalar products are zero at the same time. And then this implies that a is equal to zero with a sum of error one over q to the four, which is negligible, for example, if we assume that q is uh, uh, about uh, 32 bits long. So um, now, of course, the question is how can we um, arrive at a commitment to this uh, more complicated polynomial f now, and uh, fortunately, the uh, basically the, the the opening proof that we internally use um, um, already supports um, applying automorphisms to commitments. So we can apply automorphisms and still be able to prove uh, things about the message. So we can actually implement uh, this approach and uh, commit or let the verifier commit um, uh, or compute a commitment to this new polynomial f, which is using the automorphisms. Yeah, so this finishes uh, the technical part and now coming to the results. Um, so what we have done now in, in our recent papers is that we usually benchmark um, new uh, yeah, uh, proof systems with some standard uh, problem, which is maybe kind of uh, uh, the drosophila of lattice based uh, zero knowledge proofs. And this problem is, is something which is uh, motivated by, by uh, lattice cryptography and essentially consists of proving um, that one knows the secret in uh, many LWE samples in dimension 1024. So, concretely, as a linear equation, what we want to prove is that we know a ternary solution to a linear equation um, uh, with uh, 2048 variables. And for this problem, on this slide, I've given uh, yeah, basically a table of, of uh, the proof sizes for uh, several recent uh, uh, constructions. And there we first see that there has been a pretty large, almost a uh, hundredfold improvement of proof size in, in essentially the last uh, two years or so. And secondly, our um, linear size proof system is really competitive even compared to, for example, the logarithmic uh, PCP type uh, system or all. Now in terms of proof size, uh, proof, uh, in terms of, of, of proof runtime and also verifier runtime, we have also implemented our um, protocol and um, as is maybe also often the case in lattice cryptography, our protocol is, is very performant. So our implementation needs a prover runtime of about uh, uh, a little more than two milliseconds uh, for this LWE example and a verifier runtime in the order of 100 microseconds. And with this, um, I thank you for listening and hope to see you 
at the conference, or at least meet you virtually. <laughs>